بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبته أجمعين. So now you get to see what it's really like. We're still daddies, right? Uh, we still have children, and we still have to do our main job. You know, my main job is honey and Baba, not Imam. So don't take pictures of her, please, because we know the Zionists. They like to do stuff with our pictures, if you don't mind, but she was too scared to stay in her stroller. So, alhamdulillah, my daughter, this is my four-year-old. Uh, she's, uh, she's brave. I would be too scared to be on stage, honestly, if I were four years old. Five years old. Five, yeah, five. So I was asked to talk about uh, the Qur'an and da'wah, and as someone who actually became Muslim uh, by reading the Qur'an, uh, when I was very young, 16, 17 years old. Uh, I can reflect on personally uh, what that meant to me. Uh, we know that the Quran says, Quran That the Quran, it guides to what's right. And so I remember being at that age, uh, reading the Quran, and immediately being overwhelmed by the goodness that it invites to. And feeling like, wow, this is a text that really speaks to um, my broader sense of purpose, as well as identifying my role as a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I think there's a few lessons. I'm going to keep it brief because I'm babysitting, alhamdulillah, or I'm being babysat maybe, that we should think about in this moment where we're finding people attracted to the Quran due to the sacrifice of the Palestinian people, and specifically within this country, the incredible contribution and bravery and sacrifice of Generation Z. And so there are a few lessons we can take, and that is number one, maybe we like forgot ourselves for a while. It was really strange since 2016 to see Muslims more enamored by political nomenclature, identifying themselves as right or left, Democrat or Republic, instead of being part of the Ummah of the Prophet And in fact, we started to see divisions. I even saw divorces happen over politics in families. And I'm not talking about like with, you know, AK in Pakistan. I'm talking about someone who identified as a neoconservative and someone who defi defined themselves as a, a liberal. And then that leading to divorce of a family with multiple children. And one of the things that we can appreciate is that secular political thought is as corrosive as, sex, as sexual Western thought. That the outcome of secularism, whether it shows itself in neoliberalism, neoliberalism is going to kill the Muslims with a slow, slow attachment to oxygen. But slowly it will take the oxygen off so you don't feel it. Neoconservatism will amputate your limbs immediately. One of them wants to eat our body, the other wants to eat our soul. But to find Muslims, and maybe it's because learning the Qur'an and mastering the Qur'an and being a Qur'anic nation is hard work. It demands work. Allah says, bihi jihadan kabira, That you have to make jihad in your relationship with the Qur'an. You have to push yourself it's easier to listen to Tucker and Candace and AOC and be hip on what's going on on YouTube instead of sitting and asking yourself, what does the Quran say for this moment and how am I going to project that light into my world? And that's what made the early generations very different than us. And that's why one of my teachers used to say that Western politics is the sewage of intellectual thought. It is the sewage. And that's why everyone has something to say about it. But how many people can tell you what Hamza from Kisa'i said about Anna Dina and Allah al Islam? How many can people can tell you that Sha'ba reads a Qur instead of Qarh? How many? Oh, that's hard. No, no, it's not hard. We're hard on ourselves. And that's why I challenged me as someone who became Muslim. I memorized the Quran, alhamdulillah, in two years. And I finished the Qiraat in three is I want to say to my convert community, where is the Qur'an amongst us?
that we pay religious teachers just enough to be on Boost Mobile. But we, if we really want to scale, we would make being an imam and making, a, making especially women scholarship within the community which is needed a viable career option that people can retire on. We will not look down on them, but we have been polluted by the idea that what Richard and Meredith have given us is somehow more valuable than what our ancestors left us. We are very much like Simba looking in the water and we see a pig but we're the last bastions of prophetic guidance on the face of the earth, man. The third is we need to think about how the Quran is presented and taught to non-Muslims. And we see that now. You know, I, I went and found a copy of the Quran in the library by myself. I went to the library and I found the old Yusuf Ali one that's printed backwards. Some of the OGs, Chachas may remember that one. From Pakistan with the waves and the pages, man, the cool, you know, Grateful Dead looking graphics. And I was like, man, this book is far out, man. Look at the pages, you know. And it was printed backwards. So when I started reading it backwards, I had friends that were in the Nation of Islam who say the white man is the devil. So I began to read it and I said, man, it's backwards. Maybe the white man can't understand it. I am the devil. <laughs> and then I basically had to read the Quran by myself for three years from the age of like 16, four years, to 20. And became Muslim in the restroom, in my mother's house. Well, I hid the Quran because my mother is old school Oklahoma Christian woman. If she found Muhammad's Bible in her house, I will not be standing here today. I will be gone, dismembered somewhere in the country of Oklahoma. But it was there that I found guidance. And I remember the verse I came across in the fifth chapter of the Quran as I struggled to balance out turning my back on Jesus and worshiping the God of Jesus, strange proposition. And I remember reading the verse, that Jesus and his mother ate food. And I said, that's it. That's true. They ate food. If you ate food, how can you be God? Allah feeds is not fed. So we have to, and why Islam does a great job, I think Mustafa Khattab's translation, the, the clear Quran, is, is beautiful because it doesn't have all the parentheses. Listen, the Quran, it comes without tafsir for a reason. If Allah wanted there to be tafsir in the Quran, He would have put it there. And then we know that there are intelligence agencies and foreign governments who we all remember the noble Quran when it came out in the early 90s. What was on the first, the end of that translation? What was the longest essay? A call to jihad. There's nothing wrong with jihad. But the impact that that had on young minds and old minds of people, a few, who because they read that made very irresponsible decisions and joined ISIS and went to certain places. So we have to be careful of translations that come from overseas, to be honest with you, because we know that intelligence agencies are working night and day. So that's why I think Dr. Mustafa Khattab has done a great job of presenting a translation that's accessible, easy, the language isn't hard, and there's not all those parentheses. I don't need to know what you think about the Qur'an. I need to develop my relationship with the Qur'an. And then if I have questions, I ask scholars. But locally, Masajid, at this moment, there should be programs on understanding the Qur'an. You should be at the forefront of this. One time when I was in Boston, a library contacted me and said, can you come and talk about the Qur'an? I said, sure. The librarian, she told me, thank you for coming. I've been having a rabbi do this for 10 years. I said, rabbi do what? <laughs> rabbi cooking. You're right there. Rabbi cooking hot out meat. <laughs> she said, well, he's the only one that would respond. So the rabbi came for 10 years and taught those people about our book. I said, man, subhanAllah, I'm, I'm sorry. She said, no, no one would respond. So thinking about this moment and scaling how we bring the Qur'an and the accessibility of the Qur'an to the people around us, and there's a million ways. Young people on TikTok are doing a great job of this already. On Instagram, they're doing a great job of this already. How do you now package this for different mediums and different age groups, and you think about bringing in educators, you create a pedagogy, and you target people where they are. The last is your responsibility with the Qur'an and my responsibility with the Qur'an. The Prophet said, Al-Qur'an hujjatun lak aw alayk. The Qur'an is a proof for you or against you. I remember shortly after I became, I became Muslim in the Desi community. 
Urdu ati hai, alhamdulillah. And, uh, you know, those are my friends all from Karachi. You know, they're back in uh, Pakistan because that was before 9 11. And uh, brilliant computer science guys and other fields, doctors. Those are my boys. We used to play cricket together. Great time. I learned how to make dal, dude putty. And there was a friend of mine, I'm not going to say his name because he'll see this and I'll get a phone call. Right after I became Muslim, there was an MSA booth. I was very young, so I sat at the MSA booth with him. And people would come in Oklahoma, right? People would come and say to him, what is the message of the Quran? How is it different than the Bible? And he would say, you have to ask a scholar. That would always be his answer. So then finally I said to him, man, stop saying that. Because it shows that you don't have the confidence in your own text to understand what it's about. And when you say this, you're like punting. It's very obvious to people. Then I said to him, what is the Quran to you? And he said, Rahmat. Mercy. I said, well then say that. He said, I don't feel no, the confidence. So, first of all, to gain the confidence to talk about the Quran, attend. Maybe twice a month, once a week if possible. One of your local imams or teachers teaching the Quran. See it as a slow drip. MSAs, invite imams to come. I love what Generation Z is telling me. If you weren't at the encampments, we don't respect you. I respect that. You have Generation Z contacting us and saying, can, I know Dr. Yasser, I know others, can you travel here and come to this camp? Don't you have local religious leaders? Well, their board won't let them come. Are you serious? Their board won't let them come? It's horrible. But Generation Z, push out, invite imams and teachers to come and, and teach the Quran. Number two is to develop an axiomatic relationship with the Quran. And I'll just share one with you. Anyone who reads the Quran regularly, Imam Abu Hamid, he says in Al-Mustasfa, they will see one of the greatest patterns of the Quran, which is the mandate of the Muslim community. It is our mandate, it is our role, it is our purpose. And we see Muslims doing this, mashallah, flawlessly all the time. We have a beautiful community, man. And that is that the goal of Islam is to bring benefit and prevent harm. You find that in the Qur'an, wherever you look in the Qur'an. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, O you who believe. After that, either is a command to keep you away from harm, or a command to bring you benefit. Go home and test it. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you, as it was those before you, so you will achieve taqwa. This will bring you benefit. O you who believe, do not ask about things in tubar alakum tasukkum, if made known to you, will harm you. This is preventing harm. This is the Qur'an. A text that is guiding you and I as citizens of this dunya, headed back to our permanent abode in al akhirah, to be those gravely and deeply, excuse me, deeply invested in jalb al masalih wa dar al mafasid, bringing benefit and preventing harm. When these people come to you from these camps, they ask you, I was at a, two camps, one at GW, may Allah bless those students and SJP, man, what they did at GW was amazing. And I hear people say, you know, it was strange. I went there, and people would tell me, these kids are wahsheen, haywanat, you know, they're wild, they're out of control. I went there, the first thing they told me is, can you lead Maghrib? I said, so we have Maghrib every day. They said, can you give a talk? I said, you should, man, kill it, bro. Then one of the sisters told me, can you come for Qiyam or Leo at the GW camp? I said, what? She said, we have Qiyam every night. When I stood up to pray Maghrib, it was like some out of a Malcolm X movie, man. All these people made a circle around us and held arms. Non-Muslims. And then after Salah, I had to pull the, I wanted to do the mount, you know, the movie mount was be at ease. I was like, I'm gonna do it. I said at ease. And all them Ambers and Karens and Chris's and Tito's, they all sat down, man. I said, wow, look at this discipline. They were not, that's the bad assumption that you have of young people. If you don't live with them, you don't understand that they're actually the leaders of our community now. And they're teaching us now. And after I finished, I talked about Jesus and David. I try to use prophets that they know, people would know there. This man came to me. And he had blood in his eye, drawn down from eyes in Palestine. You know, he, was, he was a different level, man. And he said to me, Imam, 
I need a Quran. So we hooked him up. I went to UT Austin. UT Austin students were abused. Four, four three young Bengali sister told me that the police basically body slammed her and suplexed her. Our community is not aware of the physical punishment that was exercised by law enforcement in this country against not only young Muslims, but young people. You know, one week they said you're the future, the next week they call you terrorists. That means they never loved you in the first place. And that's on the right and the left. It took them eight hours to pass, giving billions of dollars to Israel. Till now they're debating student loan forgiveness. Do they really care about you? Nah. So I went to UT Austin, those brave, incredible students at MSA there under Imam Anwar, who's a graduate from Qadam, from Sheikh Abdul Nasser. And when I went there, I gave the khutbah on campus, police all over the place, drones, man, it's wild, man. Finished the khutbah, this guy comes up to me, he's like, I just want you to know, I'm really Jewish. I said, well, all right, welcome, Mr. Really Jewish. He said, but I need a Quran. And then he's like, my community, the Zionists, have turned their back on me. Can the Muslims help me? I was arrested yesterday, demonstrating for the people of Palestine. I hugged this dude, man. I said, we got your back, inshallah. So you want to put yourself in a moment to be a conduit to the Quran. How do you do that? Understand that mandate. Bring in benefit, preventing harm. Number two is don't think it's going to be easy. I, when I memorize the Quran, I memorize Surah Nisa. Surah Nisa is hard, man. Men, we say Nisa is hard in the Quran and hard in life. That's what we say, man. And so I started crying. Can Allah, can Allah, can Allah, can Allah, can Allah. The whole thing, and that in Sultan Maryam. I didn't understand Arabic then. In Oklahoma, I was full time at a, as, a, as, a, as a self, as a, you know, teleoperator, because that's what everyone did in the 90s, Generation X. And then I was a full time college student. So I started crying and so he said, the Sheikh, he looked at me and said, everyone who tried to do what you're doing had to cry on this chapter. It's not easy. The Quran is not easy because the rewards are great. The Quran is not easy because the rewards are incredible. But when you look at the early Muslim community, wherever they went, they had a focus on preserving the Quran and Sunnah. And it was that which scaled them. In America, we became more focused on being like the right and the left and forgetting that we're a prophetic community that may do politics. We're not a political community who may do prophecy. That's a very different thing. So as you put yourself for this moment, and as you learn, understand that this moment has shown us something. All these people wanted to learn about the Quran, all these people interested in studying, and we didn't scale that. We scaled our political work. We scaled certain aspects of da'wah. But we didn't scale our scholarship in the Quran in the way that we should have, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, I got you. She wants you to go there. Okay, go say hi. She just made a friend, man. <laughs> and then the last, that the Quran reminds us that our sole purpose is ibadah. Where are you going? <laughs> She's going to go to the bazaar or something? With my phone? Apple Pay? All right, you got it, Habibi. The last thing is, and I'll finish now because I have to chase my daughter. Is the more okay? You go, ya Allah. The last thing is, the more of a relationship with the Quran you have, there'll be three symptoms. Number one, your worship will increase. You will not find worship as a burden because it centers you on your purpose. Number two, you will stay away from the haram and the doubtful more because you understand the purpose of the Quran is the hereafter. Every page of the Quran, the hereafter is mentioned. That's a pattern. Every page. And finally, you will find yourself located in the community prophetically to speak out against racial injustice, economic injustice, sexual immorality, and more importantly, against shirk and kufr. That's one of the outcomes of becoming a political community. We became enamored by the mandate of the right and the left to the point that we forgot our main call to people is to be emancipated from disbelief 
and associating partners with Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. I gotta run off now and be a Baba. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum.